Um, if you've got a Bible there, turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 5. I want to start at Luke 17, 5 this morning. And we'll kind of make our way through and see where we end up with this. But we've been looking at um, redigging. We've been sort of talking about the concept of redigging ancient wells and going back and drinking from places that, what, that, that's, that once upon a time gave us life. Uh, maybe they got covered over, maybe we got too busy, maybe we got sideswiped, maybe we just got disinterested, who knows what it is. But for various so many reasons, those wells can get filled in with other things. And we move on in life and then we, we ask ourselves the question one day, why is it that I kind of feel like maybe my passion for Jesus is not what it once was? What, 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 why is my passion for prayer, his word? What, what, why is my passion for fellowship? Why is my expectation uh, of, of hearing his voice or of, of, of being used by God? Why is all that stuff kind of disappeared? And, and for many of us, there were certain things when we first came to faith and we were really excited about God and, and uh, really uh, open to the Holy Spirit moving in our lives and we were full of faith and we were full of confidence to be used by God and so on. And there were certain things in the early days of our walk with God that we were very committed to. There were wells that we drank from that maybe over time we've drifted away from. Maybe we feel like we became more spiritually mature and we don't need that stuff anymore or we became more intellectually uh, uh, understanding of the Greek and him. We don't need this stuff anymore. And we can move away from things. And we sit back and we look at our life and we go, if we're brutally honest in the quiet moments when the music's down and nobody's around, it's just us and Jesus. We look and we kind of feel like something's not quite right. Something's shifted, something's changed. And so we've been going back and looking at uh, the first 30 years of the early church and trying to dig into particularly the book of Acts and go, what were some of the wells that the early church drank from? What were some of the things that gave this group of believers the kind of life that at one point it was said of them, hey, these people who've turned the world upside down have come to this place? So we'll be going back and looking at a few different things. We've covered uh, about three of those, uh, those wells. I want to move on to a fourth uh, well this morning. And it's this. It's the well of radical obedience. The well of radical obedience. How many of you know that when you read the first 30 years of church history, the book of Acts, that there's some radical stuff going on in there. There are some people that, in the midst of great persecution, a lot of pressure, stood their ground, believed what Jesus had taught, followed the voice of the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of great persecution and pressure, but they put their face like flint towards a certain direction, that direction of obedience to God, and they walked the walk. And they just let the chips fall where they may. They let the chips fall where they may. I'm reminded of Daniel being told, you know, you can't pray to your God, and he flings open the gates and goes, hey, I've always done this, and I'm always going to do this. And he faces out the window and everybody sees him and he just goes, look, I'm, I'm going to keep doing what I do because you can't tell me I can't pray to my God. You can't tell me that I can't speak the name of Jesus. You can't tell me that I, I, I can't do these things that God commands and calls me to do. And what I love is he ends up being thrown in a lion's den, but hey, he, he doesn't fight and resist the authorities when they come. He's prepared to stand his ground He's prepared to obey God and then he'll just let the chips fall where they may and he'll face the consequences of that, but he's not going to allow the consequences of that to determine whether he obeys or he doesn't obey God in the midst of that. And how many of you believe and understand and agree that we are in a culture today where maybe we're coming back to periods and seasons like that where uh, it's very uh, possible and we're seeing it now, people that are deciding like Daniel to face in that direction and get on their knees and to pray and they're losing their jobs, and they're facing all kinds of things there. And it just, it's starting down here, and, 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 and they're being removed from schools, and they're being told they can't do this, and they can't do that, and they're being sacked, and so on. All because they're just going, well, look, we're, we're, we're still going to obey God. I, I cannot erase the memory of Jesus from my life, or the call of God upon my life, or the teachings of Jesus and my call to obedience. I can't wipe that all under a mat for the sake of keeping this, or hanging on to that, or whatever. I've got to, I've got to be true to this God that saved my life. When I was lost, he found me. When I was broken, he put me back together. When I was full of guilt and condemnation and covered in sin and had no way forward and was in a room without an exit sign, he came and he flicked the switch on and he led me forward. And I can't deny that God and I won't deny that God for the sake of fitting into a group of people, whether it be a bunch of friends or a workplace or a culture. And so we want to look today at this fourth well, the well of radical obedience. In Luke 17, 5, it's a very short and simple verse, and it simply says this. And the apostles said to the Lord, what? Increase our what? 
faith, increase our faith. How many of you would like your faith increased today? I would love my faith to be increased until my shadow is healing the sick. I think I've still got more to go. You know, until I'm, 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 you're taking a hanky from me and you're going, and epileptics are being healed and lepers are being cleansed and paralytics are jumping up. I feel like God, well, I've probably still got some places to go and some areas to grow, some things to deal with and more expectation that I can believe for. There's more things I can believe in for. And so these guys said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, normally when we think about increasing faith, we think about increasing faith for some type of result, right? Uh, I'm going to go and pray for this sick person. So, you know, Lord, increase my faith to see a healing. Or Lord, increase our faith to see a miracle. Sometimes when we think of faith, we think about faith as something that we need to see increased in our life so that we can see some kind of an outcome perform, some kind of sign or wonder or something like that. But the truth is, when you read the context of this verse, the previous verses, Jesus is actually talking to the disciples about, you know, if somebody does the wrong thing by you, a thousand times, and they come back to you and say, sorry, you've got to forgive them. You've got to forgive them. He's not talking to them about how to get a miracle. He's not talking to them about how to see a sign and a wonder. He's talking to them about how to relate to people. He's talking about living the Christian life, not some kind of miracle. He's talking about, if you're going to live this Christian life, here's the kind of person you have to be. And I remember that old um, saying um, that they used to, years ago, uh, what would Jesus do? Remember that? It came out that I think Sydney Sheldon, was it Sydney Sheldon? Someone Sheldon wrote a book. <laughs> and uh, uh, in that book, that's where that saying, what would Jesus do, came from. And there were people running around, what would Jesus do? Bracelets and WWJD shirts and coffee cups and pins and, and you know, WWJD become a great industry. But the truth of it stands, what would Jesus do? I think we've got to be careful today that we haven't flipped that a little bit and we've turned what would Jesus do into what would we tell Jesus to do? What would we tell Jesus to do in that situation? Once upon a time, we've all heard this, 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 this uh, phrase before. Um, Jesus taught us to walk in the opposite spirit. But if we look around the world today, very few people want to walk in the opposite spirit. We want to attack fire with fire. And it's unfortunate, but even in the church, we don't want to turn the other cheek anymore. We don't want to walk in a different way to the world. We want to fight for our rights. We want to, all this sort of stuff. But the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith in response to Jesus saying, hey, you've actually got to walk in obedience to me and live the Christian life. People aren't going to like you. They're going to do wrong by you. I want you to forgive them. Increase our faith. <laughs> they didn't say, Lord, increase our faith in response to Jesus healing a leper. Oh, we've seen you heal a leper, increase our faith. They didn't implore him, increase our faith when Lazarus came out of a tomb or increase our faith when he preached and the Pharisees went, I uh, 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 don't know what to say to that one. Got no answers. But when he talks to them about actually just living day to day the Christian life, they said, Lord, it takes great faith to live as a Christian. And it does, doesn't it? It takes great faith and great trust in Jesus and the character and nature of our Heavenly Father to every day get up and go, I'm going to live my life as a believer today in spite of a culture or a workplace or a schoolyard where I'm being picked or pushed or shoved or baited or ridiculed or rejected. I'm going to live the Christian life today. I'm going to walk each day and each moment of this day in obedience to what I know God would say to me and what I know he is saying to me. The New Testament word for obedience is a compound of two Greek words, hupo, which means under, and a cow, which means to hear. So to obey literally means this, it means to hear under. To obey God means to hear under. So obedience has two important aspects to it. Number one, it has the hearing aspect, hearing what God has to say to us. In Mark chapter 3, verse 31 to 35, there's an interesting story of Jesus. He's got a bunch of, of, of people that are sitting at his feet in a room while he's teaching. And in Mark 3, 31, 35, it says, Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him, and a multitude were sitting around him. So his mothers and brothers are outside, and they're calling to him, and he's in a room, and it says there's a bunch of people, and they are sitting around him. They're just sitting there, listening. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brother? He's not disrespecting his family lineage, but he's making a point. And he looked around in a circle at those who what? 
just sat about him. This bunch of people just sitting at his feet, listening to what Jesus had to say, listening to these teachings that he was saying. And he says this, he says, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God. Now, what were they doing at that moment that he's referring to as the will of God? What were they doing? They're sitting and they're listening to him. They're sitting and they're listening to him. He says, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Taking time to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. Just being with him. See, if we want to be like Jesus, we've got to be with Jesus. Amen? We want to be like him, we've got to be with him. We've got to make time to be with him. Um, Acts 13, verse, verse 1 and 2, it talks about the, there, were, there were prophets and teachers and leaders and people together, uh, and they were having a prayer meeting. And in the midst of this prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit said to them, separate to me Paul and Barnabas to the work to which I've called them to. And I, I look at that and I go, here's this picture of a group of people that were ministering first to God. And so if you minister to God, then God calls them out and he says, now I want you to minister for me. But the people that minister best for Jesus in the world are those that minister to Jesus first as a priority, being with him and ministering to him. And it's those that minister to him are the ones that he calls out and says, now go minister for me. And so if anyone's sitting here and you have a desire, a heart, you want to preach, you want God to use you and your gifts, your abilities, your call and so on, you know, the best way to get there, step number one, is get in the habit of being with Jesus. Be a person that ministers to him. How many of you love it? Uh, you parents, you just love it when your children, uh, uh, I remember when kids are small and they come and they just want to sit at your feet and they just want to talk. And yeah, you might want to pull your hair out at times, but there's something sweet and beautiful about it, isn't there? They just want to be with you. They just want to hang out with you. And it doesn't even have to make sense. They just want to be with you. And there's something that blesses the heart of a parent when their children just want to be with them. And like I said, at times you might want to pull your hair out, Clint, you've done it. Bo, even more so. But at the end of the day in our hearts, we just love that, don't we? We just love when they just want to be with us. It ministers something to us. And I think that's what ministry to God is. It's, 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 it's just wanting to be with our Heavenly Father, the one that loves us, the one that has good plans and good purposes for us. And we sit at his feet and that's how we hear him. Here's the thing, you don't need to beg your Father to speak to you. You just need to slow down enough to listen. God's speaking all the time. God's leading all the time. The problem is not trying to get, what sort of a father do you have to beg to answer a question for you? Well, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does your father give gifts to you? If you've got a question on your heart, a concern, whatever, you don't have to beg your father to answer you or speak to you. What you do need to do, though, is slow down, sit at his feet, make some time to listen. Listen. So the first part, of that is hearing. First part of obedience is hearing. And then once we've heard, we've just, then we've got to get up. These people had to then get up and they had to go and they had to actually do the stuff that Jesus was talking about, right? You've got to go and do it. You've got to go and you've got to live it. You've got to get up and put into action the things that you know that Jesus is saying to you. The stuff that you know God is speaking to you. Obedience is hearing. But then once we hear, we then submit ourselves under the authority of that word. And that word trumps my word. That word trumps your word. That word trumps the word of culture. And we go and we actually do the stuff that Jesus is saying to us to do. Whether it be through his written word or whether it be through the voice of the Holy Spirit. We do what he's saying. No good being a hearer and not a doer. It's pointless. In fact, in Luke uh, 6, when Jesus talks about the wise and foolish builder, I think it's Luke 6. And he starts off by saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do the things that I'm saying? In other words, if you're not doing what I'm saying, I'm not the Lord. If Christianity had KPIs, the KPI would be obedience. That would be the KPI for Christianity. Right? It's obedience. It's impossible to be a disobedient Christian. It's impossible to be disobedient to the Lord Jesus. Because if he's the Lord Jesus, we can't live a life of willing disobedience day after day after day. So active submission is the second part. There's a story in 1 Samuel, and everybody here is aware of it. It's a story of a king called Saul. Everybody remember a guy called Saul? King Saul? Yep, come around before King David. And Saul lost his kingship because of disobedience. There was a battle about to take place, and Samuel the prophet had said, you know, I'm going to turn up in X amount of time, I'll do the sacrifice before the battle. And then you'll go out to fight and you're going to win because that's what happens. That's what God's will and plan is. And Saul decided that he would do the sacrifice himself through a series of 
unfortunate events, took it upon himself to do that. And this is where we get that famous saying in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 to 23. Samuel turns up and he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of God? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey my voice, to do what I'm telling you, is way better than any sacrifice you feel like you're making for me. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed or to listen than the fat of rams. And then he goes on from there. And he gives us this picture of what disobedience is. I don't know what, what, what you think or whatever, but when we think about disobedience, what do we think of disobedience? In, in our minds, it's kind of disobedience is like an option. Or disobedience is the opposite of obedience. It's just kind of, you know, we, we, we choose, we don't. We doesn't, it doesn't sort of matter too much. We live in a world where, you know, unless you can convince me why I should obey you, why should I do that, Mum? Why should you do that, Dad? It's just not good enough because mum and dad said anymore, is it? You've got to tell them why. But the problem with that is then if they don't agree with your why, well, they don't have to do what you say. They don't have to listen. So we've got this kind of different picture of obedience now as this sort of, you know, almost like a choose-your-own-adventure type thing. You can, you don't have to use. But I don't know that that's really what God wants for his people, to just pick and choose. And so then he goes on, he talks about disobedience. He says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Saul's just disobeyed, and he says, You know what your disobedience is? I'm going to call it what it is. It's rebellion. It's not just taking another option. You're actually rebelling against God. This is what, he, this is what Samuel's saying. It's rebellion. And not only is it rebellion, then he likens it to witchcraft. He says, This is like witchcraft. Ooh, it's a, that's an ugly picture of disobedience. I don't like that picture. I prefer my picture. Because then I don't feel so bad when I'm disobeying God. <laughs> but if I look at this one, jeez, rebellion. Rebellion against God. It's a form of witchcraft. He goes on, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. It's kind of this, somehow he links up this imagery of idolatry there. I'm idolizing my perspective over yours, God, or my will over yours. The, the, whatever voice is more dominant than God's voice in that moment, that's the one I'm worshiping. The one I'm bowing to is the one I'm worshiping. It's an ugly picture of disobedience other than just, I just don't want to do that, so I'm going to try something else. And then he says at the end, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. So when I disobey... I'm not just taking another path or another option. He says, you're actually, when you disobey God, you literally I want you to imagine you're rejecting God. Ever been rejected by anybody? Ever had anyone reject you? Ever, ever go to school back in the day and go up to a girl and say, will you go with me? Was that, was that how you used to do it in your day? You used to go up to the little boy or girl and go, will you go with me? Or you'd write a note and give it to your mate who'd slide the note across the table, will you go with him? And that feeling when they would say no. Oh, what? She didn't really say that. She doesn't know who I am. She would never reject me. But he says you're rebelling against God when you're disobedient. He says it's like witchcraft, like idolatry, and you're literally rejecting the word of God. So we see obedience sometimes as an optional extra. God actually sees it as the only true option for his people. He sees it as the only option. And he sees it as the best option. And the option that will bring about the maximum blessing for you and the option that will bring about the maximum glory for God no matter what the situation is. Here's the thing. Sometimes we think sacrifice is the counterweight to disobedience. Sometimes we can live like sacrifice is the counterweight to disobedience. It balances out disobedience. That's what's going on here. Saul sacrifices, and he comes along and goes, look, your sacrifice, and he calls it a sacrifice. The sacrifice is not, God's not wanting you to run around just sacrificing for him. He, he actually just, he wants you to obey him. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes, we can live as if sacrifice is the counterbalance to disobedience. But God, I'm, 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 I'm tithing 10%. I even give 11 maybe. I'm, not, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm praying every day and I'm reading your word and I'm doing all these things that you're saying. That all these, these religious commands and rituals. I turn to church every Sunday, so on. But then when he says to you, but I want you to love your wife a bit better. Or he tells you when you're down the supermarket, hey, I want you to pay for that person's groceries. Or, hey, I want you to ring up this person. They're struggling. And 
want you to pick that person up and drop them to the doctors or I want you to forgive that person that offended you and hurt you. And sometimes we keep ourselves busy and feel really good because we're doing all the sacrifice things, you know. And Christianity, we can be a bit like that sometimes. We, 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 we've got to be very careful we don't tell people, come to Jesus. And then once you come to Jesus, here's the list of sacrifices you have to make. You've got to sacrifice every Sunday morning now. Come to a gathering with a bunch of believers, whether you like them or not. <laughs> You've got to sacrifice time and read. And all these sacrifices, they're good sacrifices. Nothing wrong with them. And I'm not saying don't make them. But when we come to faith in Jesus, the first thing we should be telling people is now that you've come, now that you've come to him, get to know him. Because he's a father and he's going to speak to you. And here's the thing, when you, when you live in obedience to the things that he's saying, that's when you'll be blessed. That's when the world around you will be blessed. And that's when things will begin to shift and change. And that's when life comes into you. But sometimes we kind of feel like, well, I'm counting up all the things I'm sacrificing for you, God. Surely that's enough. But obedience is what God wants. He's not necessarily impressed with sacrifice. I'm not saying we don't sacrifice for God. What I'm saying is don't turn your faith into a, a whole bucket full of sacrifices at the expense of just obeying the voice of God when he speaks to you. In the little ways when nobody sees and no one's around. To obey is better than sacrifice. Now the New Testament church understood the power of radical obedience. They understood the power of radical obedience. The early believers obeyed God even when it didn't make sense. Even when things didn't make sense, they obeyed God. Some of God's instructions just don't make sense. Love your enemies doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. And I need faith. Who needs faith to love their enemies? I've got some enemies right now and I'd love to just punch them in the face. That's the truth. I would love to go toe to toe with them. I'd love to, I'd love to tell them exactly what they look like to the rest of the world while they're telling the rest of the world what I look like to them. I would love to do that. But I can't do that. It's not right. It would not be obedient to God. Feel good, I'll tell you what. If I want to go chase down the road of feelings, man, I'll be a very different person. Loving your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Doesn't make sense. Praying for those who persecute me. Blessing those who speak bad of you. Yeah, blessing them means speaking good of them. I don't want to speak good of people that are speaking bad of me. It's very hard to do. Hey? You, he said that about me. Well, let me tell you a couple of things about him. But you didn't know that. I need faith. I need faith to live this Christian life and to obey God. To give is better than to receive. Who actually believes that? Seriously. Hands down. We're humans. We love getting things. Gimme, gimme, gimme is the mantra of the Western world. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And Jesus says, hey, to, 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 it's better to give than to receive. We go, yeah, really? Oh, but it is. It is. Might not always feel it, but it is. And so I want to live in obedience to him and I want to believe that and I want to live a life that's committed to giving. I want to live a life that's committed to contributing to the world around me, not sitting back saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. Because it's better. Because it's better. Some of these things are hard to do. In Luke 24, 49, can you imagine you are the disciples of Jesus? You've walked with him all these years. They come, they take him away, they beat him, they crucify him, they spit on him, they call names, all that stuff. The disciples all scatter and run. Jesus has resurrected, gets them back together. And then he, then he says this, I send the promise of my father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That doesn't make sense. Hang on, Jerusalem, the place where they just, <laughs> they just run us out and attack us and ridiculed and you what? Go back there? Tilt, tilt. This doesn't make sense. How about we go to another village and we start again? You're alive. I get it. You've risen from the dead. Yes. But hey, think about our safety here, Jesus. We're not going to go back into the belly of the beast, back into the lion's den. Let's go somewhere else. But he says, no, I want you to go back there. And they did. They did. Acts chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. The high priest rose up and all those who were with him. And they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles, put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. Really? You've just been teaching, thrown in prison. An angel sets you free. I'm thinking I'm running as far as I can. But the angel says, I'm only going to open up the prison doors to throw you straight back out there. So go back out there and let's pick up where you left off and start preaching to people openly and they're all going to see you and who knows what's going to happen next time. I'm not doing that. I want to run. I want to hide. But they went out and they go back into that space and they preach. A lot of times what, what God said to people didn't make sense. Just like a lot of things God says to you and me, often they don't make sense. But they were committed to obeying God even if it didn't make sense. Even if it didn't make sense. 
See, we've replaced radical obedience in our lives with rational obedience. We've replaced radical obedience with rational obedience. It's got to make sense first, God. God, if you want me to do something, we're just like the little child. God, you want me to do that? Explain why. Tell me why. And I better agree with your why, because if I don't agree with your why, then that lets me off the hook and I don't have to do it. And I'll just get away with it. Because we live in a world now where everyone's got to be explained why, 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 why. Sometimes God doesn't explain why. We've got to be committed to radical obedience, not just simply rational obedience. The early church was committed to radical obedience. Rational obedience says, only if it makes sense to me and I agree with it, then I'll do it, Lord. And there are so many more things that God wants to do in us and through us, and many of them don't make sense. How many of you have ever done anything, separate God? How many of you have ever done anything in your life and not really understood it, and then two years, five years, ten years down the track, you look back and all of a sudden it makes sense then? How many things has God done in your world? said to you, done through you, and it's made no sense. And then down the track, you look back and you go, oh, wow. Maybe at the time, if God had told you why, maybe you wouldn't have done it. Maybe you would have been frightened. Maybe you would have been scared. Maybe you would have resisted God in the moment. If God had told me way back in the beginning when I got saved that any part of what he wanted me to do would be stand in front of people and talk, I would have run a mile. Because the first time I got up to speak in front of people, my whole body went into spasms, and I'm not joking. An auditorium with about 600 young teenage kids and all the teachers that had me the year before. And I stood up in an auditorium and, and I, I went to share my testimony and my legs literally just... All these kids burst out laughing. And I'm thinking, oh, good Lord, this Jesus thing should be easier than this, surely. And I walked to the edge of the stage and I sat down on the edge of the stage to take the weight off my legs, thinking if I take the weight off, they won't do this. And all of a sudden, my legs stopped. And then all of a sudden, the hand that's holding the microphone... Literally starts going like this. And all these 600 kids start laughing, pointing. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, this is the worst mistake of my life, you know? And then I thought, what I'll do is I'll tuck my arm in like that while I'm sitting on the edge of the stage. And then sit there like this and tell these kids, you come to Jesus, you can be just like me. Wouldn't that be great, you know? I finished. I literally threw the microphone down in Ballina High School, the big basketball auditorium, jumped off the stage, bolted through the guts of the kids out the back door into a mate's car, went to the beach and said to God, never, ever, ever again. That's not my thing. It took a number of years before I sort of stepped back into that. But who knows why God's telling us to do some of the things that he's telling us to do. But the point is this. The early church drank from a well of radical obedience. They obeyed God. It wasn't rational. It was radical. God spoke and they lived it. The, the, the written word of God or, or the spoken word of God, the spirit, his unctions to you, they were committed to that. And the second thing, the early believers obeyed God even when it came at a cost. Even when it came at a cost. Acts 4, 18, 20. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. It sounds like something kind of way back in the distance, but I look at the world today and hey, that, 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 that phrase is making more and more sense in our modern Western society. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. Whether it's right in the sight of God, for me to bow to your voice over his voice, you guys, you guys are free to make a judgment call about that. But as for us, we've got one God. And it's not the dollar. And it's not popularity. And it's not fame. It's not Twitter followers. It's not my employer. It's not my culture. It's God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you decide for yourself whether it's worth the cost of obeying him, and I'll decide for myself whether it's worth the cost of obeying him. And their decision, the early church said, it's worth the cost. They lost homes, they lost businesses, they were run out of town. The 12 disciples were, were uh, that, 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 these, these followers were, were eventually crucified because they just simply would not deny the reality of what had happened and they wouldn't bow to whatever cultures they were in at the time. They were going to obey God. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And they said, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it. Even at great cost. Stephen is martyred for preaching the truth to the crowds. Didn't matter what it cost them. They were prepared to pay whatever price. If you go back and you look at Saul, Saul made up all these excuses as to why he did that sacrifice, didn't he? He said, well, Samuel, first of all, Samuel, you were running late. You were, you, you were not on time. And then I looked around and I saw the armies were coming against us. And then I looked at my own men. They were running away from me because they were scared. 
And then I saw the sacrifice was still sitting there and nothing was happening. He was talked out of obeying God by what he saw around him. Doesn't that sound like today's culture? We can be talked out of obeying God by the culture around us and what's happening around us. See, once upon a time, walking in obedience to Jesus looked not that much different to those who weren't, other than how we spent a couple of hours on a Sunday, maybe. Society still had a basically Judeo-Christian worldview, but now the worldview of society has taken a sharp turn right and the differences between the church and society are becoming much more evident, aren't they? Much more evident. In other words, if I live out the truth as Jesus teaches it, if I live in obedience to the word of God, here's the reality, I'm going to stand out more and more. It's just the direction our, our, our culture is going. If I'm going to be committed to Jesus, I'm going to stand out more and more. And many of us don't want to stand out more and more. So we'll compromise on what Jesus says. We'll compromise on the word of God to us in order to still look like we kind of fit in. At what cost? At what cost to you personally in your relationship with God? At what cost to the, to the culture around us when they can't see a clear, shining, bright light of the goodness of God and, 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 and Jesus? Instead, they're seeing this sort of grey-washed version. My concern is that eventually what's going to happen in Western culture is we're going to realise that the direction we're heading very, very fast, at some point people are going to stand up with common sense and go, this is out of control, this is nuts. And at some point someone's going to pull up and go, it's like the, it's like the story, you know the old story of the king without the clothes, what was that called? You know the, you know, the little boy? You know, they, they said that you know, the, the king's got no clothes on, and, but, only, but really wise people though. Hey? Remember, what's that story called again? Emperor's new clothes. But the wise people, when they look, they'll just see beautiful scarlet and so on. And so all these rational, wise people see this naked king, but they'd be convinced that if you're smart, you'll see clothes on the king. It's almost like a prophetic tale of the times we're living in, isn't it? If you're really smart, you'll agree with this. If you're really smart, you'll see the rationale. And everyone just goes along for the ride. And then one day, this little boy goes, He's naked! What? He's naked! And all of a sudden, the whole facade comes crashing down. And here's the thing. One day, I think the facade will probably come crashing down. But the challenge for the church is when the facade comes crashing down, will there be something that has stood and been stable through the whole course where people go, okay, that didn't work. We thought, no, but this thing over here has been stable. The church has not bowed. This group of people have had something. They haven't twisted it. They haven't succumbed to the rest of the world. They haven't run around saying, yes, the king's got beautiful clothes on. They've been saying he's been naked from day one. And guess what? They were right. So there's something over there, and I wonder whether that's going to be the testimony of the church as all this comes crashing down. And third and finally, the early believers obeyed God because they knew that it was not just about them. Amen? It was not just about them. Somebody once said this, be careful how you live, you may be the only Bible some people ever read. Be careful how you live, you may be the only Bible some people ever read. Ever read? I was, I was reading about Gandhi the other day, and I don't know if you guys sort of know too much about Gandhi, but, 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 but Gandhi actually explored Christianity at one point early in his life. He, uh, he was famous for saying this. He said, if it weren't for Christians, I'd be a Christian. He picked up a Bible. He read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he was infatuated with the person of Jesus, the values of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, what Jesus stood for, the way Jesus treated the poor, the downcast, women, all those types of people. He loved Jesus. So he made the effort to go to a church one day, stood at the front of the church as he was about to walk in, and I just said to him, you can't come in here because this church here is only for high-caste Hindus and also for white people, and you're neither. And he turned around that day and never explored Christianity again. And the truth of the fact is that that we could be the only Bible that people ever read. And our obedience is not just about us. If you read the New Testament, how many times did God tell somebody to do something or speak to someone to do something and they did it and the end result was not about them, it was about other people. It was about the world around them. It was about somebody else catching a glimpse of God, about somebody else uh, uh, having the blindness taken off, somebody else seeing who Jesus was. Our obedience is not just about us. Here's the thing. If we think that our obedience is all about us, we feel like we have the freedom to pick and choose whether we do or don't because the results only fall on our shoulders. The results of our obedience and disobedience don't just fall on our shoulders. There's a whole world out there watching. There's a whole world out there that God wants to reveal his glory to. 
and he uses us. Why he would choose to use people like you or me, I have no idea. I would have created another race or something. I would have looked down at humans and gone, Adam and Eve, perfect world, sinless world, no problems, and you still choose to disobey me. I'm going to scrap this whole thing and create some new thing, and let's have a second crack at this. But God didn't. In his grace, he made us, he loved us, and he said, this is the plan of God, this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm just going to use people like you and like me. And we could be the only Bible that people read. And if I run around there saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but obedience is optional, what does that really say about who God is in my life? Uh, is God really that important? Would I, would I give up my life to follow this God that's not that important to the people that say they've given up their life to follow him? <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. Your parents, live right before your kids. Let them see you pray. Let them see you in the word of God. Let them see you giving time, money, resource to people into the kingdom. Let them see you obeying the teachings of Jesus. Kids, don't be embarrassed to let your mates see you making good biblical choices and following God. Don't be embarrassed by that. Employees, work like you're doing it directly for Jesus, even if your boss doesn't deserve it. And if you're an employer, treat your employees with dignity, even if you don't think they deserve it. Model Jesus, show Jesus to people. Be careful we don't replace what would Jesus do with what would I like to tell Jesus to do. Finish up with this. Our obedience has a massive impact on those around us. And I learnt this uh, in a really peculiar and kind of weird way, but I hope that you get the spirit of what I'm trying to say. Our obedience is never just for us. God uses our obedience and blesses other people. How many of you are in this room now because somebody else might have been obedient once and shone the light of Jesus in your life, told you the good news of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, shared a testimony with you, took you to a meeting, bought you a meal. I remember when we were in India uh, one time and we had no food. We're living in central India. We had no food. Remember that? We're sitting at the table and we've just got a little bit of rice left and we're praying, God, we've got nothing. And we didn't really hardly know anybody there. And, and a couple of Indian pastors, this man and woman knocked on our door. Here we are, the big white missionaries in India. They knocked on our door and, and said, we just felt like God spoke to us to give you a couple of bags of groceries. You know what that did for our faith? They didn't know the position we were in. They didn't know anything. But our obedience has an impact. I was in India many, many years ago, and I was, I was, I'd been there for eight weeks, and I, we never used to spend that much amount of time apart, me and my wife, not wise to do, but uh, this particular time, we were both going over there, and Jackie prayed and felt like God said, don't go, it wasn't going to be safe for her, so she stayed behind in Australia with the kids. And I went over to India, and I remember being there eight weeks away from my wife. I just want to get home. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've, I've had enough of it. Uh, we, we, we had lived there previous to that, so I was packing up a house as well and working with Indian customs, which is bizarre. And I'm riding my motorbike back to the YWAM base so that I can get off the bike, pack my bag, have dinner, go to sleep, wake up the next morning and drive in a... a, um, a, a uh, jeep to the, to the train station and head on out of the country. And on the way, this Indian pastor bumps into me. I'm driving along and all of a sudden, this Indian pastor sees me, turns around, chases after me. And I knew him years earlier. I used to live there and, and, and when we were living there and working there. And this guy says, oh, brother, you have to come and preach in my church tomorrow morning, please. And I said, dude, I can't. I've got to, honestly, I've, I've got to be in the jeep at 12 o'clock. And I know what happens in an Indian church. It's not, it's not like here, you know. If I go past the next 12 minutes... People are going to be yawning at me and looking at their watch. It's not like that over there, okay? If I was over there, I'd just be doing my introduction still, all right? But he says, come, and I'm going, no, I can't. He's going, oh, yes, you can. Of course you can. Oh, and he promises me. Oh, I'll make sure that you're finished on time. And I'm thinking, you can't promise me that. I know you can't, you know? So anyway, in the end, I said, look, here's the deal. I'll come. I'm going to be there right on uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. You need to start, please. You need to start on time because I need to be gone by blah, blah. He said, yep, no worries. So I get there and I get up and I preach. And now what happens in an Indian church is at the end of it, when you say, who would like prayer? 200 people come forward. Everybody does. And, and so you, you can be there for four hours just praying for people, right? And so I knew that could happen. So I said, this time I finished my message. I said, here's what we're going to do. The guy on the, on the drums, we didn't have all this. We just had a drum. So you get up on the drum and you're going to lead us in a song. And while everyone stays sitting, because they had the men on one side, the women on the other side, on the floor, there was no chairs. There's about 200 people. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, you, you play the song, you sit there, everyone close their eyes, wish. I'm going to walk through you, you're just going to touch on the bed, head and go, bless you, bless you, bless you, next, oh, bless you, bless you, bless you, next one, bless you, bless you. That way I don't have to stop, listen to God, you don't listen to God, you can't shake, rattle and roll, and if you do, I won't notice that I'm going to keep walking, and we'll just do the bit and we'll get out of there. 
So I'm running around going, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. And I touched this girl on the head. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to tell her that I've called her to pray for her nation. And when she prays, I'll hear her and I'll answer her prayers. My first thought was, she must know that. She's in a church. That's, that's Christianity 101, isn't it? You pray, God is, he does stuff, big deal. So I just kept on going. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I'm running around and the Holy Spirit's saying to me, Alan, I'm asking you to do something. Would you do it? And I'm saying, no. <laughs> I was very honest with him. I've got to get on a train. You don't understand, as if God doesn't understand. And I'm running around, 200 people, bless you, bless you. And the Holy Spirit's going, Alan, I've asked you to, to do something. Would you do it? And I'm going, no. I get back up, I finish, I go, thank you very much. I sit down, the pastor goes, oh, thank you, Brother Alan. I'm thinking, sweet, I've made it. And then all of a sudden he starts dismissing the people. Then a lady stands up in the back corner, holds a newborn baby up. And he goes, oh, I forgot we have a new baby. Oh, bring the baby forward. Brother Alan, would you bless this child, please? Very much. But, but, but. So I come on up again. He gives me the microphone again. And the Holy Spirit is just saying, Alan, I asked you to do something. Please, would you do it? And I'm going, no. <laughs> I want to get out of this place, dude. I want to, I haven't seen my wife for eight weeks. I want to get home. My wife and kids. So I get up and the baby comes up and I lay hands on this baby and I pray a blessing on this newborn baby and I hand the microphone back to the pastor and I sit down again. And by this stage, the Holy Spirit is just, Alan, I'm asking you to do something. Would you do it? And the pastor's about to dismiss and I thought, you know what, I can't, I can't disobey you, God. I don't know why I've got to tell this girl, praying God hears you, whatever. I thought, I'm going to have to do it because I've got to get this off my chest. So I get up and say, sorry, Pastor, can I have the microphone? I said, look, you girl up there, when I, when I prayed for you, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to tell you that he's called you to pray for your nation. And when you pray, he's going to hear you, and when he hears, he's going to act on behalf of your prayers. She erupts in uncontrollable sobbing on the floor. And honestly, if I'm just being human here. I'm going, pull yourself together. I just said, when you pray, God listens. <laughs> you know? Because I'm, 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 I want out of there, you know? But God's doing something in this girl's heart. She stands up, she comes forward, she is just whole body sobbing. And the whole room just sits there silent, saying nothing. She makes her way up the front, the pastor hands her the microphone and steps back. And she shares this story. She says, I'm a Hindu girl, born and raised in a Hindu family. But I love my Jesus. I came to faith, I found Jesus. And in a couple of weeks' time, my parents have sold me to be married to a Hindu man. And so in a couple of weeks' time, I won't be allowed to come to church and worship my Jesus or have a Bible and read about my Jesus anymore. I'll move into this Hindu family. I've got to be a part of their family, do what they do and so on. So she said, I was praying, saying, but, but Lord, this seems unfair. You saved me. You, 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 you came into my world. You showed me who you were, Lord. And now I'm going to be sold and I won't be able to do anything for you, Lord, but I love you. I want to do something for you. How can I do anything over there? And she said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to pray. Pray for your nation. When you pray for your nation, I'll hear your prayers. And when I hear your prayers, I'll act on behalf of your prayers. And so she then said, if that's really you, God, then on Sunday when I go to church, you make the, you make, she didn't, no one knew I was coming. No one knew I was coming. She said, you tell the pastor to tell me that and I'll know it's you. And I walked away from that, and she gave me a little pen, a little red pen. I pushed a button, a little light came on. I only, I only lost the pen, would have been very recently. The pen fell apart, but I kept every broken piece of it because it just reminded me of the importance of when the Lord speaks to us to be obedient. Because could you imagine if I just completely ignored God that day and walked away? My obedience was, it wasn't just about me getting a story or me being obedient to God. That's, that's secondary. That's nothing. The fact that I get to share that with you is not the reason why God asked me to say that to her. It's because there's a woman now, and I don't know whether her whole family is saved. What I do know is there's, there's a woman in India who married a Hindu man with a call of God upon her life to intercede for her people. And God gave her a promise and an assurance. When you pray for your nation, I'm going to hear your prayers. And I'm going to act on behalf of your prayers. And she knows that because of somebody's obedience. Amen? We've got to be obedient people. We have to be obedient to God, no matter what culture around us is saying, no matter how you feel, no matter what we're seeing. If we stop being obedient to Jesus, then we stop shining that light of God in the world. Our obedience is not just about us. And the early church knew that because the early church were a bunch of obedient people. And guess what? Because they were obedient to God, you and I are sitting in this room today worshipping Jesus. Amen? We've got to be that. 
for the next generation as well. So Father, I want to thank you for your word, God. I want to thank you for the obedience, Lord, of the early church. Can we stand up? I, I want to pray for us. Can we stand up this morning? Um, if you're uncomfortable, don't worry. I'm not bossing you around. Don't have to stand. But if you are, I'd love you to stand. Can you just put your hands out for me? Holy Spirit, we gather together in the name of Jesus in this place. We gather together to worship you. We gather together not to uh, just hear teachings from an ancient collection of manuscripts, Lord. We gather together to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. We gather together to meet with Jesus. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, whatever you've been speaking to people this morning, whatever word of comfort, Lord, whatever word of challenge that you have brought, I pray now, Holy Spirit, would you just seal that word in our hearts? Spirit of God, if people are not sure what you're saying to them, I pray, make it clear to them. And as we leave this place, God, let us leave this place knowing that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, knowing that we are called of God. And our first call is to follow you. It's to follow you. And Lord, don't let us play a role in robbing the world of a great picture of the glory of God because we choose for whatever reasons to not think obedience is a really, really important thing. Let us hear and come under your authority and do the things that you're telling us to do, Father. And Lord, as we head out into this next week, God, there are people in our community that are hurting that don't know you. There are people in our community that have needs, needs we can meet. They need to hear words we can say, stories we can share. And they need to experience a Jesus that we've experienced that transformed our life. And Lord, I pray, God, for each person in this room in the next seven days, would you give each of us an opportunity in some way, shape or form, only you know how. Give us an opportunity to show that Jesus to somebody that does not know Jesus this week. And we ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.